So my name is Amy Kimoto Khan. Kimoto is my maiden name, and Khan is my husband's name, who is one of your colleagues. He's a Google employee at the Boulder office where we live. So I think he's listening right now. So hi, Dave. <laughs> um, and we live in Boulder with our three children. We actually moved from the Bay Area. We used to live in Mill Valley for a good uh, eight years before we moved there. So that's where we've settled now. But just to tell you a little bit about my history and how I grew to love cooking. When I was really little, before cooking shows existed, I used to pretend that I had my own cooking show in my backyard and I would make mud pies and I would get flowers and decorate my mud with flowers. And I used to have a table, a picnic table that I would pretend, if you saw the earlier cooking shows, they used to have mirrors above the tables and that's how they would show the camera, what they were cooking. And I also was very fond of this show called Chips. Maybe you guys are too young for Chips. Does anybody remember Chips? It was like a cop show. And there were these two cops named Ponch and John. And I was like in love with Ponch. So Ponch was always my pretend sous chef. And, <laughs> and I was just you know cooking it up a storm in my backyard with my mud pies. And that's just kind of how I grew to love cooking just as a five-year-old, but really just learning from my mom and her friends. And she was part of a group called Les Dames, and I will explain their story to you later, but they used to throw these fabulous parties. And as they got older, you know, shared families would come in and all of the children of Les Dames would learn how to host and cook and create and, really make food that was appealing to the eyes. So the story behind that is that I am a fourth generation Japanese American, which is a Yonsei. So do we have any Yonsei or Sansei or Issei? Anyone Japanese? The Japanese Americans in here? So that, just what that means, I'm a Yonsei. So I'm the fourth generation of Japanese Americans to be born in the United States. So I'm actually very American. It's my great grandparents who were originally from Japan. And what that meant for us as a family was that during World War II, which maybe you know about this, maybe you don't, but two months after Pearl Harbor was bombed, Franklin Delano Roosevelt decreed that anyone that was 100% Japanese or 1 16th Japanese and was in the United States would be removed from their homes and put into uh, internment camps. And so that is what happened to both of my parents who hadn't met yet, to their families. They were given 10 days to pack up their belongings and be shipped to wherever the government was telling them they needed to go. A lot of them had businesses that they had to put in storage facilities. And, you know, unfortunately during the war, since people knew they weren't going to be coming back, a lot of their businesses were were ransacked and stolen and their you know, equipment and everything, if they had a business, was taken from them. But so that happened, and my parents were put in these camps. And then post-war, my mom was put in a camp in Colorado called Amachi. And her and her family settled there. And there was, you know, a lot of post-war prejudice as well. Um, another interesting fact is that my Uncle Joe was a member or part of the 442nd Infantry, which is the only all Japanese fighting infantry for the United States during the war. So just, uh, you know, food for thought that you have these Japanese Americans that still want to fight for the United States. Meanwhile, their families were put into camps. Uh, but basically, so after the war, my parents both settled in different places. My dad was in East LA, my mom was in Boulder, and times were kind of rough. They didn't have, they had to build themselves back up. There was a lot of post-war prejudice. They were called names. They were, had rocks thrown at them, but they, um, my mom really learned to cook and make things stretch with their garden. And we used to, they used to eat fried rice all the time, which actually is more of a peasant dish than, you know, any, any kind of, it's a comfort food, but it's just, was very inexpensive to make. And that's what they did. They kind of ate from their garden. And, and then my mom and dad both met at the University of Southern California, where 
there was still post-war prejudice even that many years later, and they weren't allowed to be in sororities or fraternities. So my mom form, formed her own sorority called Le Danse. And this was a group of other Japanese and Japanese American women who were like their own sorority in college. But as they got married and as they had children, they had like a gourmet club. And so they would have everybody come over. There would be printed menus. It was all very gourmet and delicious. And that was the first time I learned what sorbet was. And my mom used to make sor lemon sorbet and make these baskets that she'd intricately cut out of a lemon. And she told me it's a palate cleanser in between courses. And it's one of the inspirations for a recipe in my hot pot book in the dessert section, a yuzu citrus sorbet. But so that's kind of where it all started was with um, kind of from adversity and to just inspire me to continue to carry on my family traditions and preserve that culture through food. And so that's kind of where um, I began my journey and my love of cooking. So back when blogs kind of weren't all the rage, I started a blog called Easy Peasy Japanesey. And it still exists in, in existence. You can look it up. And uh, my friends were always encouraging me to share my recipes. And they said I should write a cookbook. But life took over. I had three kids. And as I started having more free time, I thought this is something that I, I would like to do. So I sought out an editor who helped me find a publisher. And four years later, we developed a proposal that was then presented to a lot of the pro publishers in the business and Race Point is who picked me up and asked if I would first write a book on ramen. So my first book was Simply Ramen, which is right here. Have any of you ever heard of it or seen it? Or have you, are you ramen fanatics? Yes? OK. So started off doing this book for Race Point, and I was given, I think, like 10 months to write it. But I just felt like my ramen knowledge wasn't comprehensive enough. So I went to Osaka to go to a ramen school called Mijiyama. And it was just very intensive, like a three day course. And it was just for me. And it wasn't, you know, I feel like you, you can take a lifetime to really learn about ramen and how it's made properly. I think almost everyone in the room has had top ramen. You know, but there's there's more to ramen, obviously, than something that's in a high salt package and dried noodle. But so for me, I think that I learned in school, like the three major components of ramen are a base stock and then a, flavor, a high flavor component called tare. And when it's used as an adjective, it turns into dare. So I'll explain that later. And then you have a high a fat component. So, and besides all the toppings, but that's kind of the orchestration of your base bowl. And then I think that if you like ramen, you probably know that there are different varieties. There's shio, which is a salt based ramen, shoyu, which is a soy sauce based ramen, tonkotsu, which is a pork bone based ramen, not to be confused with tonkatsu, which tonkatsu is a breaded pork cutlet. And oftentimes, I am served tonkotsu, and the server will say, here's your tonkatsu. So I purposefully made a tonkotsu tonkatsu in my cookbook so that there's no confusion. Tonkatsu goes on top as a topping. And, um, and then there's also toripaitan. Have you heard of that? That's like a chicken bone based broth. And so those are kind of like the, the major ones. There's different types of ramen, like a tsukemen, where you're dipping the noodles into a separate broth. There's a mazamen, which is a no broth type of ramen. So if you've had, ever had like a dandan dan dan noodle, like a spicy Sichuan, that is considered a mazamen because there's no broth. So there's just all different types of ramen bases and I mean, you can have like a shio dare, which is a salt, high, high salt component based broth mixed with miso. So you can have like a miso shio dare tonkotsu. I mean, you can do, there's all different variations. And my style is more non-traditional style, which is like, I will take a base broth and I'll mix it with chorizo and I'll make a chorizo miso, or I'll do um, a green tea duck 
ramen or it's it's just my style is more original style than very traditional but my book has the traditional in it as well have any of you been to mensho 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 is probably my favorite ramen place in in san francisco and tomoharu shono tomoharu is the chef there who i met in tokyo and he looked at all of my recipes and he his style is very original style he makes things with lamb bone, he does a chocolate ramen. He's just like a, an innovator. He owns, I think, over 10 ramen yas in Tokyo. He owns one here in San Francisco. And I think it's the, the most authentic ramen that you can find in the city. And I'm going there tonight. <laughs> so just to keep going about the perfect bowl, you know, once you get your base broth, your dare, so, the reason why you see when you go to a ramen ya and you see if you can see them serving your bowl behind the counter, they have all these different spoon measurements. So they're so unlike some places that you'll you'll be able to tell the quality difference. If you have a big pot of broth that has all of the salt components and all the flavor mixed in, then over time as it boils throughout the day, it's going to change its flavor profile. So a proper bowl of ramen has that tare, the strong flavor component, as a measurement, whether it's a tablespoon or however much the chef is choosing. And then they put the broth in, whether it's tonkotsu or, or chicken bone or a vegetable based, that kind of has no salt flavor. They add that in and then they put the fat on top. So it's called sibura. So you can take pork or any type of fat and boil it and press it through a sieve. And that's when you get those little bits of fat that sometimes you see on top. So, and then that makes a very consistent bowl for anybody that is getting it. Every bowl will taste the same, which is what you want. You don't want a saltier bowl than someone else's because it's been in the pot all day. But then you have your toppings. So you have chashu or which is like the pork, um, fatty, more fattier pork is called kakuni, which is the pork belly. But you have your big, chashu cooked in like a lighter soy, like a lighter soy teriyaki mixture, and that's sliced. I'm sure a lot of you have had do that on top of your ramen. There's eggs of all different variety. I prefer like a very gooey golden egg that kind of drips into the broth. And then you have green onion, you have um, bamboo, you can have, you know, any variety of, of ramen toppings. And then after my ramen book, my publisher asked if I would write a book on hot pots. So that's my second book right there called Simply Hot Pots. So hot pots, I think, are becoming kind of popular or more popular than they were a couple of years ago. But you have all kinds of hot pots. So traditional Japanese hot pot are like shabu shabu, which is in Japan just water and kombu, which is a, the seaweed that's coming from deeper in the sea. And so in Japan, that's all you're, you're, you're putting in the broth is water and kombu for your shabu shabu. And then shabu shabu actually means the sound you're making when you put your meat in. So you're, you're going shabu 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 shabu. And that's where shabu shabu comes from. And then the other really popular type of hot pot for Japanese is sukiyaki. So sukiyaki is, um, doesn't have a broth. It has more of a lighter teriyaki type base that you pour over and steam with all of your vegetables and your protein. So you're not doing a shabu shabu with that. But you have, there's a Macanese broth, there's Thai, there's um, Mongolian. And today we're actually gonna give you all the aromatics you need for a Mongolian hot pot. And we're also, we've also made a Macanese hot pot that, uh, or broth that ha is a chicken bone base. But just to kind of go over the, the basics about hot pot. So in Japanese, hot pot are called nabe mono or nabe for short. And the pot that's used to cook in is called a donabe. And this is a donabe. And the reason why these clay pots are really great vessels for hot pot is because they insulate heat very well. They hold heat very well. And they just, um, they're just easy to use and they can be used as steamers. They're just very multifunctional and they've been around for forever in Japan. So nothing has changed from this tradition and it always has a top that has a hole on the bottom to let the steam come out. But the great part about hot pot is if you don't have a donabe, you can use anything, a cast iron skillet that's deeper, anything with a, a lid. You can use a Le Creuset, you can use 
whatever you have at home. You don't have to have a donabe, it's just pretty to have. And then another kind of major component of a donabe is a table side burner because when you have your shabu shabu or your sukiyaki, you wanna do it table side. There are recipes in my book that have chicken that's cooking or things that take a longer time to cook for the protein and I'll make that stove on the stove top and then I'll bring it to the table. But a great part about hot pot is that it's communal and you can do it at the table. You can make it all ahead of time and there's no cooking because your, your guests are doing all the cooking. So I find that hot pot versus ramen is a much easier thing to make for guests and friends. But so today, if you'd like, I can describe all the aromatics we're using and then just kind of go over the components of a, of a perfect hot pot. So this is all of the aromatics we're using for the Mongolian. And the, these are cloves. You can probably, can you guys smell some of it? There's cloves, there's star anise. This is astralgus root, which is used often in tea in, in Chinese culture. And I actually went to Chinatown today and I went to one of the many stores that has all of the roots and medicinal things and I asked for it and he was like, I don't know what you're saying. <laughs> and I, so I had to like Google a picture of it. I was like, this is it. Um, these are cardamom pods. There's goji berries. There are dates called jujubes. This is a white pepper that's not ground. These are cumin seeds. We have bay leaves. We have just regular salt with some pepper mixed in. These are Japanese chili. And over here we have different types of seaweed. So this is wakame here. These are bonito fish flakes. This is dried shiitake mushroom. And the other types of seaweed that you probably know of, just regular sushi seaweed. The kombu that I described earlier that you use at the base of any beginning of a shabu shabu. And we have all different kinds of vegetables here. We have a lotus root. Um, these are baby bok choy, green onion, napa cabbage. And the mushrooms here we have are inoki, maitake. We have just whole um, shiitake that are fresh. We have trumpet mushrooms. I think that these are chanterelles up here. We have our tomato. This is another type of seaweed called furi, furikake. Have you guys heard of furikake? And it's just a great seasoning on top of rice or salmon or I put it in everything, but this is a great thing to discover and use. We have fresh ginger here. So a good hot pot just really basically consists of a base broth, proteins and vegetables and a variety of them and it's just whatever is in season and you slice everything up you put it all on platters on the table and you let everybody choose what they want so for me with three kids it's kind of the perfect meal because they can just put what they want to put in it and don't not eat the stuff that they don't want to eat and today we made our mongolian broth which is a vegan base but it's so it's just a vegetable broth that the kitchen made and then all these aromatics got put into it to steep. And then we also have our macanese pork broth, which is pork bone, ginger, jujubes, um, goji berries, white peppercorn, and salt. So why did you choose hot pots and ramen? Like what, what was your main reason for doing the cookbook on these two as opposed to anything else? Well, actually I wanted, the proposal that I worked on for four years with my editor was for a book called Easy Peasy Japanesey. And it was all gonna be based on these family recipes that we grew up cooking with my mom and her friends and church cookbooks. And if you're, if you're um, Japanese American and you go to church, your church has a cookbook. And so from Buddhist church to Presbyterian churches to whatever, everybody has a cookbook. And so I was wanting to culminate all of those recipes and bring that out and, and show those. But of course, Race Point said, well, ramen is all the rage. Would you consider writing a cookbook on ramen? And that's when I was like, well, they think just because I'm Japanese that I know all there is to know about <laughs> ramen, but they're also giving me an opportunity to write a cookbook. So I'm gonna do my due diligence and go to Japan and learn as best I can and write a cookbook in nine months, which is really hard to do with three kids. And, and that's why the ramen book came about and then the hot pot, pot book came about also because they these publishers do all their studies on 
you know, upcoming trends and basically what's going to make them the most income. I think that's how they choose their subjects. And, and so, and so they asked me, would you do a book on hot pot? And again, I was like, they think just because I'm Japanese <laughs> that I know all there is to know about shabu shabu or sukiyaki or hot pots. But I said, OK, I'll do it. And so, yeah, that's why I say I'm not the expert on anything. But I think that both of my books are very um, not so simple, but easy you know, for a, home, for a home cook or someone that's interested in cooking. You'll find it fairly easy. And the ingredients. Being here, initially, I wrote this book in Mill Valley when we lived in Mill Valley. So finding Asian ingredients was really easy. But I wrote this book in Colorado where the ingredients weren't so easy to find. So I've tried to kind of provide substitutes and things that you can get online so that it's that anybody can make it. Even if I have people that write me in that are from, you know, Ohio that that say that they're able to make it and enjoy it. So. Yeah, that's how those came about. If you could have one bowl of ramen for the uh, rest of your life, mm -hmm. and that was the only bowl you could have, yeah. whose would it be and why is it the best I one? would have Mencho's ramen. What's your favorite <laughs> recipe from your cookbooks? My favorite recipe from the cookbook, let's see. From the Simply Ramen, it's the hardest to make. And if you, if you eat ramen, then you know that tonkotsu is kind of like the holy grail of ramen varieties because it's stinky and fatty and it takes a really long time to make. And I, in my book, say that you need a pressure cooker, which you don't have to have a pressure cooker, but it just makes it in, in a quicker fashion. Now everybody has those, what are they called? Instapots. Insta you, can, you can make it in there also and it wouldn't take as long as boiling it for 24 hours in a big pot. But it's the most labor intensive because you're crushing pork bone down and getting all of that marrow and fat into a broth. And then if you have an immersion blender at the end, that's how you get it all creamy. So you immerse it after you take out all the bones and you strain it all through, then you take an immersion blender and you make this creamy, delicious, unctuous tonkotsu. And in my tonkotsu, my dare, remember I talked about the strong flavor component, I do a shio dare and a shoyu dare on the bottom. And then I pour over my tonkotsu. And then I do a sibura, and then I do my favorite toppings, which are kakuni, the pork belly, just like green onion, and egg, and a really good gooey egg. That's like my favorite ultimate bowl, and that's that's in the cookbook. But that's a very traditional bowl right there. Um, I'd say my favorite variation or original style of ramen in there is probably the duck one with the matcha. The matcha duck because it's just really interesting and flavorful and I think I use a shio, shio base for that one. So the two books are both laid out the same in that you have these base broths. So I think I have 15 or so base broths for the hot pot and in here I have my the four basic ones I told you about and I take those broths and I make them into different recipes. So in that, for instance, I told you about the chorizo miso. I take the miso base, I add chorizo, I do different things to it. And in here, I just take a base broth and I'll make like a, a you know, a kimchi using one of my base broths or uh, what other ones do I have? I have um, an oxtail one that uses one of my base, base broths. So it's easy for you because you can choose your own base broth and then decide how what direction you want to go with it for either book. It's it's really not for the it's for the novice both of these books. So I think that you'll be able to try them out and and please 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 uh, tag me if you make something so I can share with people that like it is easy. It's not just a coffee table book. Tag me. I'm at e.p.j from Instagram. But I always share those. If anybody ever makes anything, I always share it with my followers. And it's just fun to see because I get them from people from all over the United States. So yeah. And then my favorite recipe in this one is probably my kid's favorite, which is a Kobe beef sukiyaki. Because the sukiyaki sauce is really easy to make and it can be done ahead of time. My kids love everything in what I put in my sukiyaki. So I'll have sugar snap peas, I'll have uh, broccolini, I'll have tofu. Tofu is also uh, one of the major components of, of uh, nabe mono. So I'll have a tofu, I'll have the really good beef, and then I also make like a miso sesame dipping sauce and a ponzu sauce. So I always make those two for any 
hot pot that I make. And so, and traditionally, shabu shabu actually, you beat egg, you beat a raw egg, and you dip your beef into a raw egg after you've cooked it. But I don't think that they can do that in restaurants here because of the salmonella, or whatever. But traditionally, that's what you do. So you should try it. It's good. <laughs> Uh, it sounds like your mom was a huge influence for you and your interest of cooking. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering, what does she think about these recipes, um, especially about the more original uh, Style. recipes? Yeah. Well, you know, I'm she's Sansei and I'm Yonsei. So she's been in the United States for, th that's the third generation. So she's very Americanized as well. So she's not so, so held up on traditional, traditional Japanese. But even though I'm Yonsei, there's a lot of very traditional things that we do. It's like the Japanese gene is strong, the force. The Japanese force is strong with, with us. And so there are a lot of things that I think are more cultural that we do. You know, she always said people are eating with their eyes. So she would, when I was little, always would garnish everything. So she would say, go pick some heavenly bamboo from the yard or go get a gardenia or, and it just would have this aesthetic to it that showed that you cared and that care was what you were giving to your guests. So I think it's also why I don't imagine myself ever owning a restaurant or because I know that I can have familiarity with people through food, but m me and my cooking, it's like an extension of myself. And so I don't know that I want to cook for people that I don't know every day. So I think that's why, um, you know, she just taught me that it's an extension of yourself and how you display it and the care that you take in cooking is the care that you're showing to the people that you're cooking it for. So yeah, I did learn a lot from her. Uh, so you mentioned that you didn't want to open a restaurant. So what do you see as your path forward now that you have two of these cookbooks? So I want them to do the easy peasy Japanese cookbook. I want them to finally do that. And I think that I can convince them now at this point. I also was thinking about doing a Japanese breakfast cookbook. I don't know if you guys have had Japanese breakfast, but it's amazing and there are so many different variations. It's actually like a meal. You end up always having like a miso soup or a um, potato, potato, deep fried potato called a koroke and katsu sauce. And I mean, it's like a full meal for breakfast, but it's so delicious and there's so many variations. So a woman by the name of Julia Heffinger, she works for uh, food and wine, and she was helping me develop recipes, and she lives in Colorado. So her and I are going to kind of brainstorm and see if we can get that one going. But in my part-time, when I'm not taking care of my three kids, I am also a private chef for a Colorado Rockies baseball player. So during the season, I'm kind of at his beck and call, and um, he's really big on breakfast, too. So, yeah, so I, that's what I'm doing now, and... If I had a third cookbook, I might say, please, can I have more time to write it? Because they always seem to just give me a very minimal amount of time to write it. So I'd like to take my time and just do one that's a little bit more thoughtful. Not that these aren't, these aren't thoughtful, but my life was a complete chaos. Well, I wrote these two and my family and my, my children and my husband didn't really like that time. <laughs> but now that's over. <laughs> and so, yeah, I would like to maybe write another cookbook. I thought it'd be super fun to have a show like on the Food Network of just going to really cool Japanese places around the United States. So whether it be Shabu Shabu or Sukiyaki or Sushi or a cat cafe or a Japanese bakery, just like I just thought it'd be super cool to just host a show like that. So if you know anybody that knows anybody, <laughs> can help me do that. That's, that's what I see myself doing. <laughs> uh, thank you for sharing. Oh, no um, do you always make, when you make ramen at home, do you always make it ho like handmade? Like that takes quite a while, right? It so does. If you don't, what is the best substitute? So I, one thing I didn't mention about the perfect bowl is the noodles. So I think that noodles are fairly easy to make at home, but to get that right density, you know, I use a little bit of a cake flour, a wheat flour. Um, I combine flours and then I mix it with kansui, which is a high alkaline substance with water. Mine, I think, is like a quarter of kansui and water to my flour. But that, that variation can always change based on how you like your noodle. The alkaline in the kansui is what gives it that kind of um, springy texture. But the noodles, I think, are what people find the most daunting. So shortcut-wise, 
you guys have great fresh noodles here. So the noodle part, I think you could not, you don't have to do, you can take a shortcut there. And then when you make my base broth, it's a dada. So it's like a strong flavor component. So you could like put them in ice cube trays and you could say, I'm gonna get fresh bone broth from this place that I, from a meat shop or someplace that has great bone broth. And you can have your little ice cube things, pop them out. I would do three like ice cube sizes for one cup of broth. And then you have your, you have instant top ramen, but not top ramen. You have very good ramen. And you can just make that at home for one person or two people, or you can make the eggs ahead of time. I soak my uh, half cooked egg in the broth that I use to make my chashu. So it's like a marinated egg, but I use, I use that. So I don't waste anything. And once you make it, you'll see, oh, it's not that difficult and things can be saved or frozen or, but it's still so much better for you health-wise and so much tastier than anything you can buy at the supermarket.